do something. Uh, is there anything you guys want to know about the Bible or hear about specifically? No? I don't think we should continue in Romans because it's all, it's pretty heavy. Maybe, but... Yeah, well, we're going through and we're and we, We're already 12, 12, so... Yeah, so... Uh, but what do you want... What, what are you interested in? Do you guys have any interest in any particular thing? Well, I mean, I love everything, personally. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think... Like, end times? I, yeah, I mean, we, were, we were talking about... I was trying to do a badly job of explaining like some of the things that we thought that weren't right, like the worldwide stuff, right? With like the two witnesses and the whole Babylon thing. And anyway, well, that, that, yeah. The that most important great. thing, as far as I'm concerned, when I first meet somebody, the most important thing that I can teach them is usually about when the, the kingdom actually begins. Yeah, and, that's the part, that's it. Right. That actually causes a lot of things to fall in place later as you study. So yeah. we should probably go there and do that right quick because that yeah. is going to give you the most, uh, the most, I don't know, traction on, on how to understand what's going to happen in the end time. So it gives you a grounding and it actually gives you a point at which things will start or at which you can, you can sort of see what's happening in the, in the, in the Bible and a lot of the prophets. So let's go. Then over to Isaiah 2, very quick. You know, I didn't really realize until just this second, Brett, that that's what we studied. Like, when does the kingdom actually begin? And that's, so I, I always say it wrong, but yeah. Now, right. I, now I clicked. It, it's, the, it's the thing that is so basic and so required to understand what all the prophets are talking about that it's really, really important to get that first. So Isaiah 2, verse 1, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So this is really important because it talks about Judah and Jerusalem at the same time. And there's a difference, and I don't know how much you know about uh, who God is talking to, you know, how, how the prophecies work. But when God is speaking to a particular person, uh, or a per particular group of people, maybe I should say, uh, he will name them by name. So Judah is the Jews. Um, Jerusalem actually is not the Jews. That's actually the center of Israel at this point. And there's a lot of reasons that I say that, and it's not immediately obvious, but we can go over that at some other point. So when you're talking about Judah and Jerusalem, you're not talking about um, just Judah. And all of these things that we're going to read are obviously you know, for those upon whom the ends of the, of the age are come. So everything is related to now, in every case, in what God does. And he does it sometimes two or three or even maybe seven times deep. Um, so uh, we're talking about Judah and Jerusalem, so the center of God's people. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. So this verse alone, right by itself, tells us when God's nation is established. So mountain is a nation in prophecy, typically. Um, and it's established in the top of all the nations and shall be exalted above all the small nations and all nations, everybody will flow unto it. Okay. So this tells us, you know, gives us specific time that we can find later on when we go to further other places. Uh, verse 3, and many people shall go and say, come you and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And this is also really important when he says Jacob, because that includes every bit of Israel, not just the Jews, not just uh, Jerusalem, but every bit of Israel. So the lost 10 tribes are all there. Judah is there. Very important. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Number of really important things. Uh, he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. This is uh, everybody learning who God is and the way to do what he wants done. So it's a renaissance really of everything that God wants to be done. And when the law goes forth out of Zion, 
and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Those are key, key points because God is actually going to be speaking from that location. Um, and when the law goes forth, that's the sword of God. And when the sword of God goes forth, <laughs> a lot of things happen. Um, verse 4, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into printing hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And verse 4 takes us to a different location entirely, and seems to be, especially if you grew up in <laughs> a lot of the Sabbatarian churches, uh, it seems to take you right into the millennium, and then suddenly you set a time in your head for when this has to happen. And the reality is, it's not like that. So think of this as non-millennial uh, in the short term, and I'll prove to you why it's non-millennial millennial here shortly. So you're saying by millennial, you mean like a thousand year reign? Is exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So what, what has happened, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit because you know something about that. Um, everybody has lied about what the millennium is, and it's not intentional. They're, they don't understand. So they actually know what it is, but they put it in the wrong place. Because things that seem to be millennial in certain contexts like this one are actually not. Not at all. Um, and the way we prove that is to go over and read this, basically the same passage again in uh, Micah 4. Uh, which is almost an exact replica of what we just read. So God spoke it almost precisely the same two different times. And again, it's still, it starts with that, the last days. So you know what the context is without question or doubt. But in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the nation of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we're going to stop right there right now, and the same exact verse there in 3 is the same as in Isaiah uh, 2 4 but let's leave it right there and then let's go to where it tells us what all this means and we need to go to Daniel 2 to do that okay. so this is not a real complex study uh, it's pretty basic but it's also absolutely clear there is no doubt about uh, those two scriptures being when the kingdom of God begins and uh, it gives us the context uh, in, in Daniel 2, and more importantly than anything else, it gives us the time. It's 34. <laughs> For me. I'm sorry, we're totally with even finding Daniel Okay. No worries. It's all good. <laughs> okay, we got it now. <laughs> Most people are not very familiar with running around in the prophets to start with, and then if you have Bibles like Mom is in Marcy's, yeah. It makes it nearly impossible. So she has the same one you get back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I won't even go there because I can't do that. <laughs> I know my King James so well that it just confuses me. Um, because the language is all completely different and I can't remember where anything is. So if I read too many different things, then I'm like, oh, where was that? And what was the language and how do I find it? So I just stick with King James. Um, okay. So, really important here, we're talking about uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and we're talking about what Daniel did to explain that dream. And I always wondered as a kid, you know, what was the point? In the end, what was the point? And, and honestly, Daniel is that way a lot, because Daniel was a, a servant of God, in a time when the only upset was very limited and it was within Babylon and everything that happened was 
just related to the religion of the Jews, you know, their religion at that time, and following God. It wasn't, it wasn't a circumstance where Jerusalem was going to be destroyed again. It wasn't, you know, any of the really dire circumstances. I mean, it was dire, but it wasn't, it was more personal dire, not, not national dire as far as what, is, what was happening in Israel. So they were in captivity, and God was proving to Babylon who his people were. And that's a really interesting context because uh, it's just about politics on a relatively small scale. And Daniel was considered one of the three most righteous men in the Bible entirely, and yet he was not in a time of great upheaval. It was, it was minor upheaval, but they were in Babylon, and there was nothing, you know, nothing changed in the long run. So God gave Daniel a bunch of instructions and a bunch of information that's actually really, really useful to us because we're kind of in the same circumstance now. We're living in Babylon. We're living in a place that is very similar to what Daniel was, where religion has gone, you know, completely off the off the rails in every direction you can imagine. And that's the, the hallmark of Babylon in general is a variety of religions and no restrictions on those religions. Um, and there were, obviously, with Nebuchadnezzar, a little bit, but that actually was <laughs> solved by God to some degree. Um, so let's go ahead and start, I guess, here in... Hmm, Oh, I don't know. I guess we should start at the beginning. Let's just go ahead and go through it. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep broke from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spoke the Chaldeans to the king, in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. <laughs> and the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, and Chaldeans, just so you know, are a, were a warrior priest class, so they were typically violent uh, and nasty kind of people that killed a lot of people, but they were also priests. Uh, the, king is, the, the thing is gone from me. Uh, if you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. And what God has done is created a circumstance in which these guys couldn't just say whatever they wanted. Uh, they couldn't. They couldn't just answer <laughs> according to their own knowledge. And what that did was bring Daniel into the picture. Uh, so God intentionally brought this whole circumstance around full circle. They answered again and said, Let the king tell us his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation thereof. And the king answered and said, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time, because you see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. So, an impossible thing for a fake to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the king, obviously, anybody who told the dream, the king would recognize the dream because he had the dream. He just, it was on the edge of his consciousness. So they knew they couldn't lie. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requires, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. And Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. 
And Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the season. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desired of you. For you have now made known unto us the king's matter, and made known unto all of all four of them, not just Daniel, though Daniel was the, <laughs> the first. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon, and he went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said unto Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen in the interpretation thereof? <clears throat> and Daniel answered in the presence of the king, and said, The secret which the king has demanded, cannot the wise men, and the astrologers, and the magicians, and the soothsayers show unto the king? So, Rhetorical question, hey, these guys are idiots, uh, but God knows what's what. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed are these. As for you, O king, your thoughts came into your mind upon your bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that reveals secrets makes known to you what shall come to pass. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have, <clears throat> more than any other living person, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretations to the king, that you might know the thoughts of your heart. And then he tells them the dream. You, O king, saw and behold a great image, and this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before you, and the form thereof was terrible. And the image's head was of fine gold, his breasts of arm, uh, breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. And you saw, till that a stone <coughs> excuse me, was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them into pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that there was no place found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So, there's a lot of things I haven't explained in there really easily. But if you get to that last verse and you talk about this great mountain that fills the whole earth, uh, it kind of rings the bell on Isaiah 2 and Micah 4. And we're going to ring that bell a lot harder. But let's go back for a minute and talk about a few of the images of what is happening here. So, first of all, uh, God has described uh, this circumstance with Babylon, and he's given five iterations of Babylon. There are five Babylons that occur, from the gold head, the silver of the chest, uh, the brass of the stomach, the iron of the legs, and the feet of iron and miry clay. So, there's five iterations of Babylon, and you have something that destroys all of them. And it's this stone that is cut out without hands. And we all know, <laughs> at, least, at least partially, what that stone is. So when we talk about the chief cornerstone, we talk about uh, a variety of those different stones that have characteristics like this. Uh, we're talking about the body of Christ. We're talking about the people of God. So the destruction of Babylon, in the end, comes from the people of God. And it's destroyed all five iterations of Babylon are all destroyed at the same time. So, um, is there anything else I wanted to hit? No place. Passed from one. To the Sorry, next. I missed you. You're gonna have to say it again. 
people have never been completely destroyed. They just passed from one. Right, yeah. and, and yeah. We'll, we'll go over that in depth, but none of them, Babylon has never been destroyed uh, with a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, with a violent destruction. So if you look at all of the circumstances of Babylon in the past, from, from the first empire all the way through, Babylon has never been destroyed with violence. It's always faded out or been taken over by someone else. So the Medes took away, the Medes and the Persians took away uh, the kingdom from uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, his, his kids, but it was not, it was only the, you know, the writing upon the wall, you know, all that. Um, but it was not a violent over, overthrow. It was just a, a political shift. Um, and the same with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire faded out completely. Um, and know, Alexander. Alexander the Great. Everything faded out and separated in its own. You know, the four generals. Everything like that occurred in its way. But Babylon has never been thrown down or destroyed violently in its history until the end time. So that's key for later, but let's keep going. So verse 36, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation, inter, excuse me, interpretation thereof before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom and power and strength and glory. Excuse me. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven, has he given into your hand and has made you a ruler of, of them all. You are this head of gold. So he ruled the world and... You know, it was as perfect a kingdom as, as you get. And it's the only kingdom I've ever seen described in the Bible that is described as gold. So uh, there may be something, one, you know, one somewhere else, but I've never seen it. Um, and after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to you and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. <clears throat> and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And this is, of course, Rome. And whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. So we get down to that fifth one, and uh, we don't have a context for that in history. So some people, some people have compared that to Charlemagne or whatever, and I think that's just ridiculous. Um, but it is what it is, and the reality is, is that that iron mixed with clay tells us that the kingdom, that kingdom, is divided, and while it has strength, it also has weakness. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken says it very clearly. And whereas you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So, you know, there's a lot of people that make weird doctrines about the seed of men and, you know, go back to Genesis and whatnot, but this isn't what that's talking about at all. What this is talking about is actually pretty well hidden but it's actually talking about God's people in the midst of this. And it's not obvious, and it's not contextual, and I'm not telling you this so that you should prove it by this, because you can't. Um, but when you talk about not cleaving to one another, um, you're talking about the seed of men, you're talking about, uh, by God's definition, people that are not his, and that will not be in his kingdom. Uh, and there is going to be a separation of those, you know, peoples that is, cannot continue. But that's a side point, and it's not really all that important. Okay. What is important is verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So we go back to Isaiah 2, and we go back to Micah 4, Micah 4, and this is what's really important, because this is the moment in which God sets up his kingdom. And now what gives us the timing? Stay right there at 44 for a second. What gives us the timing? 
the very beginning of verse 44, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So the days of these kings, we have to go and find the last king of Babylon to be able to tell when that occurs. Really important because the last king of Babylon is one of the kings that he's talking about. The other king is the king that actually destroys Babylon. And that's not obvious here either. But when you start reading some other things, then it becomes very, very obvious that this has to happen in a particular way. And the key to understanding when that timing is, is right there when the last king of Babylon dies. Okay. Verse 45, for as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron and the brass and the clay and the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So God said all of these things, and he gave this prophecy to Daniel, who was essentially living in a time of peace, maybe not personal peace with, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and himself, but it was a time of peace in Babylon, and yet God gave him an enormous amount of prophetic information about a variety of different things. And that <laughs> falls to us in the end, uh, because this is the destruction of Babylon. This passage right here tells us about the destruction of of Babylon for all time. So what we know from that is that God's kingdom is set up at this time. So what happens before that? Or what happens during the destruction of Babylon? And this is where <laughs> things get a little rough as far as understanding. So I'm always mixed about where I go from here. So, it is natural to go and talk about the destruction of Babylon at that point. And that's a little bit difficult for most people to deal with on an emotional level and a variety of other levels. Uh, Me, so, it's not for her. No, it's no, not for Heather. I don't. She already uh, understood. Yeah. Let's roll. I, I'm sorry. I didn't understand what you meant, though. I, I heard your words, but I didn't get what you meant. As in, we should talk about the destruction of Babylon? Yeah, keep on rolling. Okay, well then, what we have to do is go back to Revelation. And the easiest place to start that is in Revelation 17. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is... <coughs> Yay, you're allergic to. No, it's just... Talking and it's cold around here. <laughs> um, all right. So, what we have in Revelation 17 and 18 is <clears throat> basically two chapters about the destruction of Babylon. And we just talked about that king that is, is so important because when that king is destroyed, in the days of that king, God sets up his kingdom. And I, when I say that, I don't mean like immediately within seconds of when that guy's alive, but literally within three or maybe four years, uh, God sets his kingdom up after Babylon is destroyed. And Can it, right? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. In Israel, right? Of course. Um, okay. It doesn't take but a moment to look through everything in the prophets and know that God puts his kingdom in Jerusalem, in the city of God, over there. But there are a lot of different things that have to happen, both there and over here in America, before that can happen. And so, well, let's just start reading Revelation <clears throat> 17. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come here, and I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. So, what we're going to do in going through this, and you may already know, but, but in going through this, what I'm going to do is point out um, all of the characteristics of Babylon 
that tell us who she is. Uh, it's extremely important to understand that anything that God says is absolute. When God speaks a prophecy, it does not fail except for in the very most extraordinary circumstances. And those, you know, if you want to go back and talk about that one scripture where it says that scripture that prophecy can fail, um, it can, but it's almost always related to individuals that don't do what they're supposed to in the time that they're supposed to do it. Um, and it's in the midst, typically, of a huge amount of other prophetic stuff. With Babylon, we don't have that issue at all whatsoever, because this is a thing that God has uh, known about and set up from the very beginning of time. Uh, throughout all history, he's been paying very close attention to who Babylon is and, and what their purpose is. And Babylon actually has a very great purpose uh, in God's plan, not just because of what it says here, but as you'll see, God's people, a lot of God's people, most of God's people are actually in Babylon. So we'll get to that. But the first thing I wanted to point out actually about this, this great whore is that she sits upon many waters. So waters are typically peoples. Waters are people of the ocean, you know, or waters of the ocean. Usually you see the sea or the ocean, something like that. Uh, and those waters are peoples, so many peoples, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So fornication in the Bible, according to God, is anytime someone uh, makes covenants with someone besides God. So if you start, you know, the children of Israel, when they, you know, fornicated, as it were, uh, what they did was they made agreements with other nations and did things that God did not tell them to do with other nations. So on a kind of a zoomed out sort of way, um, it's, you know, national interactions that God does not approve of. And he, he likens that unto, you know, sex between individuals to give you an idea of how it looks to him. Um, so the inhabitants of the whole earth have made drunk with the wine of, the, of her fornication. And what you have to look for then is what makes other people drunken. And we have every possible tool to make the world drunk with Hollywood and with, you know, all the different things that we do, all of the, the technology. Sleeping with this trophy. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that there's plenty of stuff going on. So, uh, verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit in, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven, hens, seven heads and ten horns. So this woman sits upon a beast, the beast, actually, and one of the characteristics of her is that she controls the greatest power of the earth. So you can look around and try and find the beast, and, you know, a lot of people have said, oh, well, it's, it's Europe, and it's Germany, and it's this, and it's that, and, you know, whatever. The reality is that's not really the most important thing. The most important thing is, is that the woman controls the beast. And it tells us how she does that in the next verse. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Uh, so she controls people in part, it goes further, but in part by those abominations and by that filthiness. And everybody loves, loves Hollywood and the things that come out of New York City and all of this other stuff. And nobody else is like that. Nobody else began that way. We started all of that here in America. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. So, again, the mother, whenever you talk about a mother, you're talking about something that initiates something. In this case, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Uh, we have done more in the last, you know, 50 or so years in this regard than anybody else in the world, by far, bar none. Nobody else has done what we have done. And I saw the woman, drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, 
and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So, stop right there for a minute. Drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Really important because when do Christians die? Christians don't die when you try and kill them with a sword. They don't die. They get stronger. Spiritually. Spiritually, they get stronger. When you try and kill them, they <laughs> come into their own. And they gain strength. A few die, but mostly they stand up and they live in faith. But when Christians actually die is when they have no pressure on them. And the flesh takes over and they do whatever it is that they do when there is no urgency to follow God. So the, the destruction of God's people is in many cases, related to what it is they're doing at that given time. And when you talk about Babylon, you're talking about, you know, every disgusting thing that there is. Uh, idolatry being, you know, the key and centerpiece of everything in America. Um, sorry, I couldn't hear you. I never picked that up before, that they're spiritually dead, not physically dead. Right. And, and it's, it's spiritually that matters. The other doesn't matter. If you die a martyr, that's great. God's happy with that. But if, yeah. you, but if you're actually going to die and go into the lake of fire, then you don't typically do that when somebody's chasing you with a knife. You embrace God and ask him for protection. Uh, and in our case, what we're doing is just embracing sin and... A lot of us are just, you know, religion, I don't know if you guys have really noticed, but religion has kind of just fallen off of everybody's scope. It's it's disappearing rapidly. <laughs> um, Everyone's and, full and, of... Yeah, and it's not, just, it's not just Christianity, but it's all religions, but Christianity is taking the, the biggest hit of everybody. Uh, so verse 8. Oh, verse 7, sorry. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. So another thing we need to hit right quick is this is a mystery. And it is a difficult mystery. And the reason it's difficult is because nobody's willing to face it. So when you look at what God's doing and the fact that he's going to start his kingdom right after the destruction of Babylon, we have to know that the destruction of Babylon has to occur. It will occur, inevitably will occur, and God's people are going to be involved in that process. Um, so, verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and I won't talk about that right now, but there's a lot of <laughs> reason we can suspect some things from what that says, but I, I, like I said, I'll, I'll go past that right now. And go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. So the beast is an interesting character also. And whenever someone can be, and not be, and then not, uh, and then be Again, there's something interesting going on, and we can talk about that another time, but just know that there's more to that scripture than just, you know, things bouncing off. Uh, there are some things that we can know about it. Okay, verse 9, And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So the woman is going to be controlling seven nations, and, you know, she's hanging out there in charge of things. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. And I'm not going to go into all this about the beast, uh, because it's not, we're not talking about the beast really, only, only secondarily. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goes into perdition. Uh, and the ten horns which you saw are ten kings which are re have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So, the beast is really important in that it is Babylon's adversary. 
and that God sets this circumstance up to where a lot of nations are giving their power to a single guy for a short time to do a particular thing. And that particular thing is to destroy all of Babylon uh, in, in the end time. And that's the purpose of the beast. So, you know, you have to kind of think of it like a plot line when you're, when you're reading a book or something and, you know, back off of all of the words that you can't really understand through, you know, this prophetic jargon, if you will, and take it like a plot line and know that this is the, the, bad, the baddest bad guy there is, and he's going to come after Babylon. And Babylon is not the good guy. She's a nasty whore that's going to get killed by this other bad guy. So reality is, is you, have to, you have to let go of a certain amount of this to be able to see it objectively. Um, so... And he said unto me, we're in verse 5, right? Oh, no. Sorry. 14. Sorry. 14. Question. Yeah, these one, shall make... So, one question. Oh, go ahead. Wait. One hour. What does one hour mean? Tip is it literally one hour or what would one hour represent? Typically what it means, and it can literally be an hour, but it's not probably... It might be. Um, but typically what it means is a short time. Okay. So they agree within a short amount of time, there's going to be some political pressure or something to do something about whatever it is that, you know, the Babylon, you know, has done in the last short bit, you know, short time. And they're going to say, all right, well, we got to agree on this. And it's just saying basically a very short amount of time. So a day, you know, you can talk about prophecy, you can talk about days and, you know, as a year of prophecy, and that's fine, but a day is not always a, a a year in prophecy sometimes it's a day so right. <laughs> you just have to you just have to roll with it a little bit and know that it's a short amount of time and it may literally be an hour but also just for background reference the hours of the day are not set the length of time of an hour in the bible and in history is not set so it didn't matter whether the, the only time that you had hours like we have hours, where they're second by second, is during the spring equinox and the fall equinox. All the other times, the hours were dependent upon where the sun was. So at noon, you know, that hour, you know, the sun was straight up. So regardless of, it, you know, it was, it was flexible depending upon what the heavens were doing. An hour was longer or shorter depending upon where you were. So for God, an hour is different than what we <laughs> we do. Okay. okay. Um, so let's go back up actually to 13 for a second again. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So this is a weird little injection. Why did he put that right in the middle of the destruction of Babylon? Uh, and the reason is... <laughs> that these kings make war with God, with his people oh. in Babylon. And he said unto me, let's keep going, and he said unto me, the waters which you saw where the horse sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues and interprets itself again. And the ten horns which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For the God, for God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will, really important, it's God's will that Babylon dies, <coughs> and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. That's telling you that it's not just this prophecy, but other prophecies as well. Really important to understand that this is God's will to destroy Babylon, and that he does it intentionally. And the woman which you saw is the, that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. The only superpower on the planet right now, or used to be the only superpower, now we have China and Russia's coming back. But the reality is, is we still have the most influence over anybody on, in, in the entire world. 
preparing to take her down. Yeah, and remember the cat, the characteristics of that horror that's controlling this beast. She has a whip and a glass of wine, and she makes them drunk, and then she snaps that whip on them. Whoosh. And that's exactly what America does right now. Um, verse 1 of chapter 18, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her delicacies. <laughs> Who has made the earth rich? Who has the only currency, worldwide currency, out there? This is obvious. If you... Yeah. If you pay any attention whatsoever, it's really obvious. So, yeah. also, all the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath for fornication. And there are a lot of people that say, oh, well, this could be Great Britain, or this is Rome in ancient days, but we know that Rome was the legs of iron. And yeah. it's Rome was not in the end time. <laughs> and we also know that Great Britain long ago <laughs> was eclipsed by America. So... Yeah. And all it takes is one thing, one thing in here that does not describe another entity, another country, another whatever it is, and it can't be that, that group of people. Whatever it is, it can't be. Okay, verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. So really, really, really obvious. Where are God's people in the end time? <laughs> in the middle. Right in the middle of Babylon. And God's command is to come out of her that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Don't be destroyed with this bitch. That's what he says. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she were rewarded unto you, and double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she has filled, fill to her double. Well, that's a little odd, isn't it? He's saying, give back whatever it is she gave to you, double. And that will actually occur. But it's not going to happen the way most people think. <laughs> um, but it is a circumstance in which God is going to give his people revenge on Babylon. And it is not going to be a pleasant or pretty thing, but it will happen in the way that God has said. And we have the capacity to affect that in the long run. Not right now, but later. Okay. Verse 7. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she says in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. And if you know anything about America's attitude, that's our attitude in the world. We can say what we want and do what we want and nobody's going to cause us any trouble because we're the greatest in the world. And that's just the way it is. Therefore, Shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. God is going to destroy Babylon, and he's going to use the beast to do it, and he is not going to tolerate anything except her death. A little scary. <clears throat> and the kings of the earth... Who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. So everybody in the whole world is going to be like, ah, what did we do when America dies? Standing afar off, verse 10, 
for fear, for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is your judgment come. So in a very, very short amount of time, Babylon falls. And verse 11. Go ahead. So, question. So why does it say great city there when America, like, is a nation? Because, because we're, we're talking about, about biblical, these are biblical words. So these are words of the time. And when you look back in history, most of the time, uh, almost all countries city states. were, were so like, city states. I see. So like Rome was a powerful nation, but it's a city. Okay. But you always talked about Rome as Rome. You didn't talk about Rome as Italy or, you know, there wasn't, I mean, there, there was a, a general name for that region, but Rome was Rome. And the greatest city in any of those, you know, different uh, kingdoms throughout the earth were always about that primary city. So it's just language. It's just language. Uh, and you can go back and look through everything else in the Bible, and it's the same way all the way through. Um, okay. Really important verse 11 because it shows us something. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buys their merchandise anymore. So total economic collapse worldwide. And nobody else can do that except for America, really. Um, and then we go into a description in verse 12 and on, verse through verse 14, of a vast array of really, you know, expensive, nice things. And, you know, we could update this to modern language, just like we can say city to nation or whatever, but we can update this with modern language and say, you know, iPhones and and Cadillacs and, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and of fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and tying wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble. These are all of the, the precious things in the time that John was writing. So God's making a point of saying, all right, all the cool stuff that anybody could possibly add up you know, and we have to update it to modern language because they didn't know about iPhones back then. It's, this isn't complicated. Um, verse 13, and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. <laughs> Everything. And the fruits that your soul lusted after are departed from you. And all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from you, and you shall find them no more at all. God's going to take all of these things away. And I don't know if you can imagine a, a world in which, you know, all of our little stuff is gone, but we're going to get there. And the nice thing is, is that when that actually occurs, once God's kingdom begins, he actually brings us a lot of stuff which we can, we can read that later if we get to that. But <laughs> these things, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, Merce. I talked. Yeah, we got to read the good stuff, too. Yeah. <laughs> so the merchants, <clears throat> the merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. So nobody is willing to come near the coasts of this country <laughs> because of... Her torment, her torment, and the capability of, you know, military weapons of this age. You don't want to get near that because something might actually fall on you. Nukes. Yeah. Probably nukes. nukes. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, or any other variety of things. Who knows? And saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so, riches, so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke for burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city? Is there any nation or city upon the earth that is greater than this nation? And the answer is no. And every shipmaster and all the companies and ships and sailors, this is everybody who deals in trading. They're all going to be ruined. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and, laying, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein we're made rich, 
all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Babylon's destruction is quick. And believe me, that's a good thing. It's a merciful death, and it makes sure that we're not in there for a long period of time in the, in the grindstone. So it's a good thing. It's scary. One hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, you heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. God is taking his vengeance, and he's saying, rejoice over this. Be happy about this. And our circumstance now is not that. <laughs> it's just scary. It's just scary and horrible. But there's a reason why we will come to rejoice over this circumstance. And it comes to the fact that we're going to change who we are in the short term so that we are in line with God and how he feels about this circumstance and not our own feelings about you know, our relatives or our jobs or our houses or all these other things that we feel is really important. Um, and the change has to come in us so that we're aligned with God, not the other way around. And there's no saving this. God's going to do this regardless, and there is no saving it. It's not going to change. It's not going to, nothing's going to happen that is going to stop this from occurring. And God is actually avenging us. Yep. Remember that old scripture, vengeance is mine, saith the eternal. Well, this is the vengeance he chooses to take for us. Verse 21, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, thus with violence shall that great city be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. <sighs> and right there you have a really important key to a variety of different things in verse 21. A stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea. So the, the basic metaphor is God's going to take Babylon and cast it into the peoples and nations of the earth and they're going to eat it and it's going to disappear. That's essentially what that metaphor is saying. But there's also some important things related to that in that... Uh, there are a number of scriptures in different places that talk about <laughs> what we call uh, asteroids coming in from space and destroying the earth. And you look over in Revelation yeah, what is it? 10, what is it, 10, 8? Ah, I can't remember, there's too many. Uh, with the with the wormwood wormwood yeah the all of there there's there's arguably three different you know asteroids or heavenly bodies that will come into contact with the earth when you start looking at the trumpets and everything so this actually is a key to that but even more importantly um it's a key to jeremiah 50 uh where it talks about that burnt mountain that's thrown into the sea so we're going to finish Revelation, and then we're going to go over to, uh, to Jeremiah 50, because you cannot read Revelation 17 and 18 without reading Jeremiah 50 and 51. So I'll read 21 again. And that mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city be thrown down, Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in you, and no craftsman of whatever craft he be shall be found any more in you, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in you. That means there's no grinding of wheat. There's no there's no food. And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in you, and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride shall be heard no more at all in you, for your merchants were the great men of the earth, and for by your sorceries were all nations deceived. Your merchants were the great men of the earth. Who are the great men of the earth right now? Who are the, the wealthy and the powerful? CEOs of all these corporations. Absolutely. Uh, and by their sorceries were all nations deceived. And there's a lot of deception going on, but technology is actually one of the greatest deceivers because it tends to make people believe 
in things made by men's hands, not God. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. All that were slain. That's a pretty big... <laughs> that's a pretty big accusation by God. In her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. And obviously we're talking about from Nebuchadnezzar on through the fifth Babylon. So let's go over to Jeremiah 50 and 51. And Jeremiah 50, 50 and 51 are uh, a lot more, there's a lot more, excuse me, information um, about God's people in here. So when we go through this, we're going to run into God's people a whole bunch more. And there are actually six different direct commands for people to flee Babylon or to leave Babylon. And they're in various places in the prophets. So that one where it talks about that we just read in uh, Revelation 17, um, there are actually a bunch more of those. And we're going to get down to one of those here in a minute. Okay. Okay, so before you get to those, why haven't you come out of Babylon? Well, I have. I, when I, when I read that, I, you know, that's why I have a house here in Roatan because I was fleeing Babylon. You know, but I always wonder others that do that same thing. Haven't you left back yet? Or do you think there's going to be another location where... Oh, you, you're, you're breaking up. I missed some of that. Like, will there be some other indication, like, when we're supposed to leave? Or is it really talking about, like, right now? There actually will be a lot of indication. So, and I understand exactly what your question is, and I'm not laughing because I'm laughing at the question. I'm laughing because, yeah, you're absolutely 100% right. There's a lot going on there. So I left Babylon the first time in uh, 1999, and I went down to Chile and stayed down there for approximately two years. So okay. the reality is, is I've done what you're considering and what Marcy has done and what mom have done, and I don't believe that there's anything wrong with that. I believe that's a work of faith, and that's fine. But there are other things going on, and my my job with God is not to be in some foreign country trying to hide uh, from the circumstance. The reality is, is this is going to happen, and when all in all of these descriptions of God's people, God's people are in Babylon until the very last second, for the most part. So one of the things that it says there is go not out with haste, nor go by flight. Let's look that up really quick. Uh, let me get a different window here. With haste, I think that's with an E on the end, nor by, let's try that and see if that finds it. Yep, Isaiah 52, 12. Uh, for you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. Uh, actually, let's go up a little bit. So, Isaiah 52 is really cool. Um, but let's just stick with 11 and 12 right now. Depart you, depart you, go you out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go you out of the midst of her, be you clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. So we're talking about we're talking about that time, and if you go back up through the context of here, uh, we're talking about God's people in verse one: "Awake, awake, and put on your strength, O Zion; put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. For henceforth shall there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean." So we're talking about in verse two uh, is even more important: "Shake yourself from the dust, arise, and sit down, O Jerusalem; loose yourself from the bands of your neck, O." captive daughter of Zion. When you talk about captivity, you talk about these circumstances where God's people are in captivity. And God has always described his people as being in captivity to Babylon. And that's what this context is. For thus says the Lord, you have sold yourselves for naught, you shall be redeemed without money. And, and it goes in and describes all these different things. And it talks about the Assyrian, it talks about all these different things 
and when you get down to this moment where actually, uh, let's just hit it right quick, verse 10, the Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. This is when God shows himself for who he is. Okay, now you go back to Isaiah 2 and to Micah 4, and he's beginning his kingdom. His arm is going to be very, very clear. This is also a, a sideways uh, description of one of the two witnesses, because the bare arm of the Lord actually is one of the two witnesses. And I can't prove that to you right now because it's too complicated and there's too much, but I'm, that's the case. So when you talk about this departing, and it's in a prophetic sense, with God showing himself to the whole world, then you know what the timing is. There's no question about when this occurs. And we have to leave, depart, depart, and leave Babylon at that time. So let's go back to Jeremiah 50, unless you have another question about that. No, so, that's good. I, I, and you only sense. are leave if you find, you know, as, as a servant of God, you have repented Right. Yeah, I, I can't hear what you're saying, Mom, but the reality is is that, that God is giving us a way out, and we're going to take that in the right moment, but most of God's people are not awake yet. So we're in a circumstance where most of God's people are still dead asleep, or you know, vaguely starting to wake up and get uncomfortable. But it's going to get to the circumstance where we're going to be martyrs and we're hated of all nations for his name's sake. And there's a variety of different things that have to happen. So, um, you know, the, some of the easy things that, you know, well, we can talk about that later. There's, there's other things. There's a lot of other things, but there's a lot of discussion that needs to go with it. So let's, let's continue with Babylon because that's the foundation for understanding this whole thing. And there's a lot of keys in here, too. Okay. Yeah. So God says, well, it's verse 1, the word that the Lord spoke against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Declare you among the nations and publish and set up a standard, publish and conceal not, say, Babylon is taken, Bel is confounded, Merodach is broken in pieces, her idols are confounded and his, her images are broken in pieces. For out of the north there comes a nation against her which will make her land desolate and none shall dwell therein and they shall remove, they shall depart, both man and beast. So let's pause right there. This never happened in history. Jeremiah prophesied that this would happen. <clears throat> but in history, Babylon has never been destroyed at all. So you know. Uh, right. It, it, it has faded away and it's been taken over politically, but it's never been destroyed in violence. So when you talk about this out of the north, there comes up a nation against her, which will make her land desolate and none shall dwell therein. That has never occurred in any of the four prior Babylons. Never happened. So this is unquestionably a prophecy of the end time, and it's focused on that. In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, and they shall, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping, they shall go and seek the Lord their God. Verse 4 is also one of the big keys to understanding prophecy. Whenever Whenever you see Jerusalem and Judah and Israel, maybe more importantly, Judah and Israel, <coughs> together, that is a key point in history. Because the only time that that occurs is when God's kingdom is reestablished. So you will see vast amounts of circumstances where Israel and Judah are spoken of together in the same context, like this, and you can always put it in one place. And that gives you a, a, a very big nail to hang a whole bunch of different things in prophecy on, because when they come together like that, there's only one time that that's prophesied in the end time, in that way. So really, really important to notice the names of God's people and when, you know, what they're doing at that time. Uh, verse 5, they shall ask the way to Zion with their faces pointed that way, saying, Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. And this is what we call the new covenant right now. That perpetual covenant, and that is a particular time. It happens in a particular time, and it happens 
when the atonement occurs, when God's people come back to Zion, ask the way to Zion with their faces pointed that direction towards Jerusalem, saying, come and let us join ourselves in the Lord, to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. And that's when the kingdom of God begins. It's great. It's wonderful. It's amazing. My people, verse 6, has been, have been a lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Also really, really crucially important. My people have been a lost sheep, and their shepherds are to blame. And the ministry of God's churches have caused everybody to go sideways, every which direction. And it's largely based upon bad doctrine. That's what God says about it. All that have found them have devoured them, and their adversaries said, We offended not, because they have sinned against the Lord, and the habitation of justice, even the Lord, the hope of their fathers. Oh, we haven't done anything wrong, because they sinned already, and we're just, you know, helping that along. Remove out of the midst of Babylon, and go forth out of the land of, Chal of the Chaldeans, and be as the he-goats before the flocks. <laughs> Huge. Right there, he says it. He's talking to his own people. Remove out of the midst of Babylon, and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans, and be as the he-goats before the flocks. And anybody who does that, like Marcy and Mom and you guys, uh, reality is, is God's not going to punish you for that. He says, do it, and be as the he-goats before the flocks. Just remember, go not out with haste, nor go by flight, and know that the remnant leaves from Babylon to go back to Jerusalem. So God's doing a work, and it's going to be somewhat similar to, you know, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. So, you know, not with haste, nor by flight, and, you know, it is what it is. I have learned over time that my place is to be here and actually help deal with that. So I'm not planning on leaving anytime soon. Uh, and I pray that God does what he wills, and I will try and follow his will in that. Verse 9. For lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. From thence she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man, and none shall return in vain. Basically everybody, if you look back there in Revelation 17 and 18, I don't know if I said it or not, but it says from all the coasts of the earth, uh, everybody that rises against Babylon is going to get a piece of her. And that's just the way it's going to happen. And Chaldea shall be a spoil. All that spoil her shall be satisfied. If anybody goes after America, they're going to get something. Because you were glad, because you rejoiced, O oh, you destroyers of my heritage, because you were grown fat as a heifer at grass and bellow as bulls. And this is talking about the Babylonians. And, you know, America's interesting because it has been a bastion of many good things, and it's also been a horror of many bad things. And the further we get into history... The closer we get to the times of the Gentiles, which we're in now, where the Gentiles take over everything, and it's like being in a Gentile country, that's what that's where we're at. So as long as God's people had some influence over what was happening, then good judgment did sometimes occur all through America's history. And the less that we have an influence, the worse it's going to get. And that's just the way it is. And God is angry because of how Babylon destroys his people. Uh, verse 12, your mother shall be sore confounded. She that bore you shall be ashamed. Behold, the hindermost of nations, she'll, she shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. America is not ever going to recover from what happens to her. Because of the wrath of the Lord, it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. Everyone that goes by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at all her plagues. Put yourselves in array against Babylon round about. All you that bend the bow, shoot at her, spare no arrows, for she has sinned against the Lord. 
shout against her roundabout. She has given her hand. Her foundations are fallen. Her walls are thrown down. For it is the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance upon her as she has done. Do unto her. And he's talking to the whole world about that. So, you know, it's a love-hate relationship with America. Everybody loves the stuff that we're, you know, selling and hates us for the way we abuse everyone. Cut off the sower from Babylon, and him that handles the sickle in the time of harvest, for fear of the oppressing sword, they shall turn every one to his own people, and they shall flee every one to his own land. Everybody's going to leave. If they can get if they can, they're gonna leave America. Welcome in. Israel is a scattered sheep, the lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria has devoured him, and last his Nebuchadnezzar. This Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has broken his bones. So, again, we have Israel being mentioned right in the midst of this. And, you know, this is the time of Jeremiah. This is <laughs> 535 B.C. The language is going to be a little bit uh, odd for us. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land, as I have punished the king of Syria. And notice that we're talking about what seems to be a historical context, but realize that Babylon was never destroyed violently. It was taken over. There were, you know, military involved, but they were not destroyed like anything like what is spoken here. And I will bring Israel again to his habitation, and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan, and his soul shall be satisfied, satisfied upon Mount Ephraim and Gilead. We're going back to Israel. That's the only place we have a home. Once America's destroyed, we're going to Israel. And probably before it entirely gets destroyed. We're not going to stay here. We have no, we have no hope here. We have no, no lasting habitation here. There's nothing in this country that is going to last. It's going to end and we're going elsewhere. In those days... No. Right. In the, verse 20 is really important. In those days and in that time, shall the, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. This is a unique act. And again, we have Israel and Judah together in one place and actually being forgiven of all their sins. They, you won't be able to find a sin because God's going to forgive it. And that's what we call the atonement. That's another thing that we'll have to go over at some point. Uh, <laughs> because the atonement is <laughs> really important. Okay. Mm -hmm. Verse 21. Go up against the land of Merathame, even against it and against the inhabitants of Pecod. Waste and utterly destroy after them, says the Lord, and do according to all that I have commanded of you. And I don't know who Merathame and Pecod are, but... The reality is these are names of the peoples that God wanted to destroy. And if you chase all of those names down, they come down to the people in Babylon or the people who are destroying Babylon or whatever the context that God is talking about. Verse 22, a sound of battle is in the land and of great destruction. How is the hammer of the whole earth cut asunder and broken? How has Babylon become a desolation among the nations? So here's another really important characteristic of Babylon. God calls her the hammer of the whole earth. That means somebody who has pounded the whole earth. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can, you can start listing Iraq and Vietnam and, you know, Cuba and, and Russia and, you know, everywhere. You know, even little places like Korea and, and Japan and all of Europe, I, North Africa. I mean, is there a place that we have not hammered? And the reality is that no, there isn't. <laughs> Let's have the ability to do it. I have laid a snare for you, and you are also taken, O Babylon, and you were not aware. You are found and also caught because you have striven against the Lord. <sighs> so what's God going to do? He's going to snare her, and you're taken unaware. This is going to be a surprise. It's going to be something that is not expected. Verse 25, the Lord has opened his armory and has brought forth the weapons of his indignation, for this is the work of the Lord God of hosts in the land of the Chaldeans. 
come against her from the utmost border, open her storehouses, cast her up as heaps, and destroy her utterly. Let nothing of her be left. Slay all her bullocks, let them go down to the slaughter. Woe unto them, for their day has come, the time of their visitation. And this is definitively the opening, the opening uh, salvo of the day of the Lord. This is the moment when God's anger overtakes the world for the first time. And then verse 28 again. Wow. Excuse me. The voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of his temple. And there's a reason why he says the vengeance of his temple. Because... That's primarily who's going to get out. Most everyone else is not going to get out without losing some skin. And even the people of his temple, are, you know, the inner court, uh, are going to lose some skin, but they're not going to, they're not going to lose as much. Um, and if you look at what, you know, who the two witnesses are sent to, uh, they're sent to the inner court of the temple of God. And they're the only ones who escape. So, uh, I'm not saying that they're the only ones that escape entirely, but they're the only ones that escape uh, without being taken into captivity and, and into slavery. So, uh, verse 29, Call the archers together against Babylon, all you that bend the bow, camp against it round about. Let none thereof escape. Recompense her according to her work, according to all that she has done, do unto her, for she has been proud against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. Therefore shall her young men fall in the streets, and all her men of war shall be cut off in that day, says the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O most proud, says the Lord God of hosts, for your day is come, the time that I will visit you. And the proud, the most proud, shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up, and I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it shall devour all around about him. His cities, again, we have a circumstance here where it talks about more than one city. Um, thus says the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel and the children of Judah were oppressed together, and all that took them captives held them fast, and they refused to let them go. And know that whenever we're talking about Israel and Judah together as captives, um, it, occasionally they're spoken of together, but it's rare when it's not talking about um, them coming back together. So the, the brotherhood between uh, Judah and Israel was broken a long time ago, and it will not come together again until God's kingdom is established. This is a circumstance where they're being described as captives that are held fast. Um, and if you look in America right now, it's obvious that uh, Christianity, more or less Christianity, uh, and the Jews are both here. They are both here, but there is no brotherhood between them, or very, very little, <laughs> very little. Uh, we send a lot of money to Israel, but <laughs> there's not there's not much brotherhood. <laughs> okay. Uh, their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He shall thoroughly plead their cause, that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. A sword is upon the Chaldeans, says the Lord, and upon the inhabitants of Babylon, and upon her princes, and upon her wise men. A sword is upon the liars, and they shall dote. I'm not sure what that verb means. I haven't looked that up in a while. A, word, a sword is upon her mighty men, and they shall be dismayed. And a sword is upon her, their horses, and upon their chariots, and upon all the mingled people that are in the midst of her, and they shall become as a woman. A sword is upon her treasures, and they shall be robbed. So... In America, you have mingled people. So, melting pot, very clear. Um, a drought is upon her waters, and they shall be dried up, verse 38. For it is the land of graven images, and they are mad upon their idols. So, again, graven images, <laughs> mad upon her idols. Therefore, the wild beasts of the desert with the wild beasts of the islands shall dwell there, and the owls shall dwell therein, and it shall no more be inhabited forever, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. America is going to become a ruin. And I used to think that there would not be a single person that was living there. And there are a lot of different descriptions about, and it says there shall no more be a son of man there, and there are you know, a variety of different descriptions. And I've come to realize over time that there will be people there 
but these owls and these wild beasts of the desert and all that stuff, the description of what that is, is actually the worst people in this entire world are going to come here and take over everything that they can take over. And it's going to be the worst opportunists in the world are going to end up living in America. And it is not going to be a pleasant place to be at all. Uh, ugh. Ugh. But it's, it's never going to come back. It's going to always be a residue of everything. Verse 40, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbor cities thereof, says the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. That was the scripture I was referring to. I should just kept reading. <laughs> um, and a son of man typically means a man of God. So if it says sons of men, then it's typically speaking of evil people. Uh, but there, there will be people. They're just not going to be, they're not going to be men they're going to be the worst scum that you can imagine. Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation, and many kings shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. They sh shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon horses, every one put in array, like a man to the battle against you, O daughter of Babylon. And whenever you see that daughter, know that it's typically talking about... Uh, the last iteration of something. Or uh, whenever God talks about the daughter of Jerusalem, it's usually after a cataclysm. So when Jerusalem was destroyed the first time, she's referred to as the daughter of Jerusalem afterwards. When God puts somebody through something, then there's a kind of a birth process through that destruction. And what is left over is typically called the daughter. So that's a kind of a a general truth about prophecy and how that phrase works. The king of Babylon has heard the report of them and his hands waxed feeble. Anguish shook hold, took hold of him and pangs as of a woman in travail. So our president, when it comes down to that moment, is just going to be <laughs> like that. <clears throat> Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the swelling of Jordan under the habitation of the strong, but I will make them suddenly run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? For who is like me? <laughs> wow. And who will appoint me the time? And who is that shepherd that will stand before me? Therefore, hear you the counsel of the Lord that he has taken against Babylon and his purposes that he has purposed against the land of the Chaldeans. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their habitation desolate with them. So without going into a great deal of detail and without going over to uh, Zechariah 11 and discussing all this in much greater depth, when God's talking about this, who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her and all this other different thing, these different things, the key actually to understanding what that actually means is down in here in the least of the flock. So particularly the least of the flock. When you talk about the least of the flock, you're talking about God's chosen people. And they're typically the people who have been oppressed by the shepherds. They've been oppressed by everybody. And they're the ones he's actually, those are his people. Those are the ones he wants out of this whole circumstance. So like, Chosen, the very elect. The very elect. The, the very elect. These are the people who have not taken other people into captivity. These are the people who have not taken money and become hirelings. These are the people who have done what they're supposed to do, and typically everyone has made them a prey one way or another. You know, in the churches, they've they've been kicked out, and they've been you know told to go here, or go there, and get out of here, and you know they've been oppressed one way or another throughout all these circumstances. And that's who God actually wants out of all of this business. That's who God's searching for. So when you talk about this, surely the least of, of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their habitation desolate with them. It's actually a, a really uh, vague description of one of the two witnesses. If you look up that least of the flock, there, it, it's inescapable that's if you know anything about what's going on. Those in there. Yes. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved and a cry is heard among the nations. So the earth is moved. Uh, that happens. 
the big earthquake in, I think it was Japan, uh, I think it moved the earth two centimeters, something okay. like that. Couldn't it be the poles flipping, right? It could be. I, I don't think it's that extreme at this point, uh, but it's possible. Um, you know, there's a lot of possibilities, but I think that's probably reserved for a little bit later. It says the earth staggers like a drunken, and there's a, a lot of different scriptures, but I think the destruction of Babylon is... I go back and forth on it, honestly, and I tend to think, you know, the, the language tells me that it's very probable that the, the destruction of Babylon is the second trumpet. But like I say, I go back and forth because there are so many descriptions and there's so many things that have to happen. Um, it's very possible it is, it's the second trumpet, but we can talk about that another time too. There's lots to talk about. <laughs> lots and lots and lots. Okay, verse chapter 51, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind. So God sends all kinds of people and different things against Babylon in the time. And sometimes it's, it's just hard to comprehend because there are so many things that God says about it. I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind. And I will send unto Babylon fanners that shall fan her and shall empty her land. For in the day of trouble they shall be against her round about. So maybe chemical weapons or biological weapons, something that, you know, fanners trying to move air to, I don't know. You know, it's hard to say what exactly is going on there, but a destroying wind does not sound like anything but Maybe the radiation or chemical, biological, one of those things. Uh, and against him that bends, let the archer bend his bow. And against him that lifts himself up in his brigandine or his ship. And spare not her young men, destroy you utterly all her host. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and they that are thrust through in her streets. For Israel has not been forsaken. Again, Israel right in the middle of this. For Israel has not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Flee out of the midst of Babylon, another one of these. Deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance, and he will, reckon, uh, he will render unto her a recompense. So... <laughs> This is inevitable, and it's scary, and it's dangerous, and the only way we have through this, and there is a way through this, is faith walking in the will of God. And the will of God is that this occurs. So we have to get our minds around this in a, you know, in a real way. And it's not going to go away. It's not going to stop happening. It's not going to, you know, it's going to be what it is. And there's nothing we can do about it. <coughs> we have to go with it because that's what God wants. Um, I'll read that one again because that's one of the biggest ones there is. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Babylon has suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl for her, take balm for her pain, if so be, she may be healed. And here is the one place in the entire Bible that I have found where God would have preferred not to kill America. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. How for her, take balm for her pain, if so she may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go everyone into his own country, for her judgment reaches unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies. And there, uh, my view of this scripture is that there was a potential possibility of somebody doing what they should have done, where God could have kept America alive and could have done his plan without this circumstance. But the reality is it never happened. And everything that God has spoken of her will happen the way it has. And there was just a, a really small percentage chance of something happening that could have, 
prevented this, but it didn't. Verse 10, the Lord has brought forth our righteousness. Come and let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord our God. Wow, that's a good verse right there. The Lord has brought forth our righteousness. Come and let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord our God. We have a purpose, and our righteousness, which is not apparent now at all, there is none, uh, is going to come, is going to arrive, <laughs> and God is going to bring us to Zion, and there we will do the work of the Lord our God. It's, it says this over and over throughout the prophets so many times that it's ridiculous. Make bright the arrows and gather the shields. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes, for his device is against Babylon to destroy it, because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. Again, the vengeance of his temple, the vengeance of the Lord. This whole thing is to fix the earth. Set up a standard upon the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong. Set up the watchmen. Prepare for the am prepare the ambushes. For the Lord has both devised and done that which he spoke against the, ha the inhabitants of Babylon. O you that dwell upon many waters, abundant in treasures, your end is come in the measure of your covetousness. So we have two really good characteristics to look at here. Is Babylon dwells upon many waters, three actually, abundant in treasures, and the huge measure of covetousness of this nation. The Lord of hosts is sworn by himself, saying, Surely I will fill you with men as with caterpillars, and they shall lift up a shout against you. And he's talking about military. He has made the earth by his power, he has established the world by his wisdom, and he has stretched out the heaven by his understanding. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightnings with rain and brings forth the wind out of his treasures. Every man is brutish by his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image, for his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. So, again, like all through the prophets, we're talking about idolatry. We're talking about the behavior of men that God hates. First you know, three of the Ten Commandments are all about idolatry, and, and you know, that's where we're at right now. They're a vanity, a work of errors. In the time of their vis visitation, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. So God's going to peel Jacob and Israel out of this circumstance, and that means we have to be peeled out of this circumstance. So, the biggest thing that I see as a horror within Christianity today is the fact that everybody is comfortable with where they're at. And most of them, and I'm talking about all of mainstream Christianity, uh, most of them think they're just going to evaporate and rise up into the air and meet God and that suddenly, you know, they're not going to have to deal with any of this and that their life is going to continue as it is until suddenly their righteousness is raised up to God and that's that. But that's not how God does things. And there has never been a circumstance throughout the Bible, throughout history, where God did not destroy his people before he saved them. That's just what he has done every single time. So, you know, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, we were just reading Romans. The bad things come to God's people first, and then the good things come first. So when the bad things come to God's people, sometimes the bad things come to other people, like Babylon. But then before the bad things come to the beast, the good things come to us. So it's just about how God lines it up and makes it happen the way he does. Verse 20. Well, actually, let's read 19 again. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. You are my battle axe and weapons of war. For with you I will break in pieces the nations, and with you will I destroy kingdoms. He's talking about his own people. He is going to use us. 
and it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. I will make you a new sharp threshing instrument with which we will, uh, which with, I, with which I will thresh the nations. There's a lot of scriptures about that have the same, you know, idea. Um, and with you, I will break in pieces the horse and his rider. And with you, I will break in pieces the chariot and his rider. And with you, I will also, I will break in pieces man and woman. With you, I will break in pieces old and young. And with you, I will break in pieces young man and the maid. And I will also break in pieces with you the shepherd and his flock. And with you, I will break in pieces the husbandman as the yoke of oxen. And with you, I will break in pieces captains and rulers. And I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight. And when he says in Zion, he's talking about in his people, Zion. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, says the Lord, which destroys all the earth. And I will stretch out my hand upon you and roll you down from the rocks and will make you a burnt mountain. And this is <laughs> really important because the, the symbology here with the burnt mountain is, is in a number of different places in the Bible. And Babylon gets the credit for destroying the whole earth. And why do you think that is? You guys have any ideas? Because we have literally, with our technology, we have polluted everything on this whole planet. All the technology, the Industrial Revolution on, we have just polluted everything. And we have done no favors for any of our neighbors, whether they're our immediate neighbors or our distant neighbors in other lands, we have been the cause of the absolute destruction of our environment. We have destroyed our own house and caused everybody else to go mad and destroy their houses in the same fashion. So, yeah, God, absolutely. And, and the people, I mean, the, the environmental destruction is, is the least of it, actually, but it's the easiest to see. When you have that environmental destruction, then you have the destruction of all the people and you have the misery that that also brings with it. And, you know, that's what God's more concerned about than the, you know, the ecology or worshiping trees or whatever. Um, verse 26. Or, you know, the list goes on and on. Yes, it's a long <laughs> list. I have trafficking and... I, yeah, it, it's huge. The, the sex trafficking and the, the drug trafficking and the, I mean, everything. And, you know, it's hideous. And they shall not take of you a stone for a corner or a stone for foundations, but you shall be desolate forever, says the Lord. And once that occurs, nothing is taken from Babylon for, for that reason. But realize that there is a reason that God cuts his own stone out before the destruction without hands and takes it from Babylon. And, you know, we, I'm referring back to what we were talking about earlier, when we were talking about, and Daniel there, and Daniel too, um, because there's a reason that God uses Babylon to shape his people. And the reason is, is that we are actually a sieve. America is a sieve for God's people. It's a way to strain all the, the nasty out. It's a way to strain the chaff out. It's a way to strain out all the people who would rather have sin than have God. So the people who are surviving in this worst of environments and actually doing what God wants, that's a good thing because the whole process of the end time, the whole process of what God's doing is to separate the wheat from the chaff and the sheep from the goats. That's his purpose in this end time. So when he put us or allowed us to go into captivity into Babylon over time, multiple times throughout history, um, there are reasons for that, and they're good reasons. Um, but it's not more about it's more about God sifting us than it is, you know, a lot of other things related to us. It's not about us having a good life or or living, you know, kind of like the best times of Israel and you know David's time or whatever. It's not about us trying to be, live the best way we can. I mean, it is, but a lot of it is about God sifting out those people who are following him. So know that there is a reason that we're here. <laughs> uh, verse 27, set up a standard in the land, blow the trumpet among the nations, prepare the nations against her, call together 
against her the kingdoms of Ararat and Mini and Ashkenaz and appoint a captain against her and cause the horses to come up as the rough caterpillars. So this isn't a secret. This isn't a secret. And if you go right back up to the, the beginning of, of uh, Jeremiah 50, and it says, um, if my brain will kick in here right quick. Uh, where are we at right now? 27. Ah, gotta go to the bottom. Where it says, uh, declare you among the nations and publish and set up a standard, publish and conceal not, say Babylon is taken, Bel is confounded, you know, Babylon is taken. The reality is, is that God wants us to say these things. He wants us to publish this far and wide because the people who are in control of this nation are not going to listen to this garbage anyway. It's a bunch of weird idiots that are saying this. But we need to say it and to declare it as God has said, because it is going to happen and it is going to be a surprise and it is going to be something that is going to be known of the whole world. And as a matter of faith, when it does happen, um, it's going to be known for what it is. So there we are. Um, verse 28, prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes and the captains thereof and all the rulers thereof and all the land of his dominion. And the land shall tremble in sorrow for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. But the mighty men have, of Babylon have forborne to fight. They've remained in their holds. They're going to stay on their army bases and hide. They, their might has failed. They've become as women. They have burned her dwelling places. Her bars are broken. One post shall run to meet another and one messenger to meet another to show the king of Babylon that his city is taken on one end and that the passages are stopped, and the reeds they have burned with fire, and the men of war are frightened. So all of our military might is going to be useless. And the reason is, is that there are going to be so many people against us all at once, that there is no possibility that we could even come close to starting to fight against it. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon, <clears throat> is like a threshing floor. It is time to thresh her in a little while, and the time of her harvest shall come. So, again, that metaphor of the harvest, really, really important whenever God talks about metaphors that are related to the harvest. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has made me an empty vessel. He has swallowed me up like a dragon. He has filled my belly with his delicates. He has cast me out. The violence done to me and to my flesh be upon Babylon, shall the inhabitant of Zion say, and my blood upon the inhabitants of Chaldea shall Jerusalem say. And when he's talking about Jerusalem, he's talking about the people of Jerusalem, not the city over in the Middle East. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will plead your cause and take vengeance for you, and I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. So let's back up to 35 again for a second. The violence done to me and to my flesh shall be upon Babylon, and shall the, shall the inhabitants of Zion say, and my blood upon the inhabitants of Chaldea shall, Jer shall Jerusalem say. Currently, we our blood, yes, it is spilling out on a regular basis, but it's mostly by people, <laughs> you know, taking little parts of us. But before this is over, they're going to take big parts of us, and we're going to be hated of all nations. And when you are hated of all nations in a land where there's Twitter and all of this other stuff, it's going to be painful. We are going to have to stand on our own as pillars, and there's not going to be a big group of us that are going to all stand together. We're going to be taken to the point where <laughs> there are just going to be ones and twos of us that are dealing with each other, and they will know us because we love each other. And that's the circumstance that we're coming into. We're not there yet. We're not even close to there yet. They're not oppressing us in major ways. They, they are, but it's not in, in personal ways where people are spitting in our faces. And, and They're laying foundation. Not letting our kids go to school. And, I mean, just all the different things that are possible. It is going to get ugly. And there is nothing we can do to stop that. It will happen. We will either be on God's side and deal with it and stand as pillars, or we'll wander off in the lake of fire, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. It's going to get to that circumstance. So 
you know, it is what it is and it's distressing and it's horrible. It's horrifying. <laughs> um, but that's what God's going to do. And it's hard to look at. I cannot tell you over the years how many people that I have told this and they've understood it. And then three or four weeks later, they're like, oh, no, that can't possibly be because because they can't face it. And, it's and they never do they? Huh? Most, most of they them never, never come out of it. They're, I, I don't know that. But most of the people who refuse to face it to start with, you know, or, or make up an excuse why it can't be true within, you know, the first three weeks or a month or so. I don't, I don't think they ever get past it, but I went through all the skin. Thing. No, <laughs> it takes a while. It, it is an emotional weight. It is a, a battle to stay focused on God and what he wants instead of, you know, focusing on the horror of it. It, it is not easy. And, you know, most people know, you know, who actually read their Bible and actually follow God, they know that it's going to be, be hard. They know from all the things that, that God has said over and over that it's not going to be easy. Um, but when you see, you know, in living color, all the things that God has against this nation and, you know, our neighbors and our towns and our, you know, all the people that we know, it, it's hard. It, it's not easy. It is not a, it's not a walk in the park. No. Um, but the only way through is to face it, you know, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we are all of us going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And if we can't do that, we might not be there. There are a lot of people who are not going to be there just because they won't face the ugly things that happen in the end time. And it's, it's sad and it's horrifying. Uh, but I'd rather be horrified and obey God and live through it than <laughs> be horrified and die <laughs> or worse yet land up with satan and nancy pelosi oh, i yeah Oof. please no please that would be worse. <laughs> there it is in babylon verse 37 let's keep going and babylon shall become a heaps a dwelling place place for dragons and astonishment and a hissing without an inhabitant they shall roar together like lions they shall yell as lions whelps in their heat I will make their feasts, and I will make them drunken that they may rejoice and sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, says the Lord. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams with the he-goats. How is Shishak taken, and how is the praise of the whole earth surprised? So again, we have that thing, the praise of the whole earth. That's a description of Babylon. It's a description of America. The praise of the whole earth. We've done so many wonderful things, you know, including win World War II for everybody. <laughs> How has Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? The sea, the world, has come up upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of the waves thereof. Her cities are a desolation, a dry land, a wilderness, and a land where no man dwells, and neither does any son of man pass thereby. I will punish Bel in Babylon, he was the king at one point, and I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he has swallowed up, and the nations shall not flow together any more unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. My people, here's another one of the commands. Go you out of the midst of her and deliver you every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. And lest your heart faint and you fear for the rumor that shall be heard in the land, a rumor shall come both one year and after that in another year shall come a rumor and violence in the land, ruler against ruler. That's a really important scripture because it tells us something that occurs before Babylon falls really important and it also tells us it is likely that we will be in the midst of a civil war throughout this process there will be two rumors those rumors hmm kind of interesting what is a rumor nowadays it's probably a, a news report it's probably no well it's probably some kind of news report it's probably something that you know, makes the circuit of all the news agencies and all the Twitter and all the everything. And it's probably something that's going to go boom and then fade out. And then again, it'll happen another time. Boom. And then fade out. I don't know. Can't say a hundred percent, but if I had to, if I had to judge what a rumor is based upon what a rumor was back then and what a rumor is today, I would say that's probably the circumstance. Viral. Good word to use for that. 
Therefore, behold, the days come, verse 47, that I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon, the idolatry, and her whole land shall be confounded, for all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. And when you think about a couple of hundred million people dying, it's not pleasant. It is very unpleasant. But that's God's judgment, and we have to get used to it. We have to deal with it. <sighs> Clamp down on our horror and, you know, do what needs to be done. That's the only thing that we can do. Soldier on. Then the heaven and the earth and all that is therein shall sing for Babylon, for the spoilers shall come unto her from the north. So people are going to come and just take everything they could possibly take out of this nation. As Babylon has caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon shall fall the slain of all the earth. God basically takes out his <laughs> a huge amount of his wrath and blames Babylon for virtually all of the dead people that occur in the earth. You that have escaped the sword, go away, stand not still, remember the Lord afar off, and let Jerusalem come into your mind. <laughs> Where are we going to go? We're going to Jerusalem. And let Jerusalem come into your mind. We are confounded because we have heard reproach. Shame has covered our faces. This is where we should be. For strangers are come into the sanctuary of the Lord's house. And we know what the Lord's house is. It is his people. It is the churches of God. And the churches of God right now are utterly polluted. There are strangers in here. And I'm not saying maybe in this group, but in all of the churches of God, there is horror that is going on in enormous fashion. And the hirelings that have, are stealing the sacrifices of God's people are everywhere. Christ went in and kicked all of those people out of the temple of God. And what were they doing? What were they doing? What were the money changers doing? They were buying and selling the sacrifices of God's people. And we have the same precise, exact circumstance in this time. Where people are basically just taking the tithes of God's people, the sacrifices of God's people, and stealing them. And we have, you know, my people love to have it so. We are in a, a horrible circumstance. And, you know, the end of it is what God is going to do with Babylon. But we need to let Jerusalem come into our mind. We are confounded because we have heard reproach. Shame has covered our faces, for strangers are coming to the sanctuary of the Lord's house. Wherefore, behold, the day has come, says the Lord, that I will do judgment upon her graven images, and through all her land the wounded shall groan. Though Babylon should mount up to heaven, though she should fortify the height of her strength, Yet from me shall spoilers come unto her, says the Lord. A sound of a cry comes from Babylon, and great destruction from the land of the Chaldeans. Because the Lord has spoiled Babylon and destroyed out of her the great voice, when her waves do roar like great waters, a noise of their voice is uttered. Because the spoiler has come upon her, even upon Babylon, and her mighty men are taken, every one of their bowls shall be broken, for the Lord God of recompenses shall surely requite. And I will make drunk her princes and her wise men and her captains and her rulers and her mighty men. And they shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, says the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts. And this is absolutely true of the political situation today. These people are asleep and they are asleep in their sin and their horror. And they're not paying attention to the actual dangers that are around them. And those dangers are different than what they think they are. They think that it's about, you know the latest rumor of this or that and the scandal of this or that or how some other country does whatever. But the real problem with this country is that we have cast off God's judgment and we do not follow any of the things that God said to do and that a nation should do. That's where the real problem is. That's where the real problem lies. So when we act without justice and we, you know, all of the horrible things that we do in this nation and you know judgment is nowhere then yeah these people are going to fall asleep they're going to be utterly lulled to sleep and we are too but when we hear what's coming hopefully we have the tendency to wake up hopefully yeah. 
Verse 58, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The broad walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken, and her high gates shall be burned with fire, and the people shall labor in vain, and the folk in the fire, and they shall be weary. And when he's talking about this, he's talking about God's own people. The people there are us. We're laboring in vain, and it's going to be wearying. It's going to be tough. Verse 59, the word which Jeremiah the prophet commanded Sariah, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, when he went with Zedekiah, the king of, uh, uh, when he went with Zedekiah, the king of Judah, into Babylon in the fourth year of his reign, and this Sariah was a quiet prince. So Jeremiah wrote in the book all the evil that should come upon Babylon, even all those words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, when you come to Babylon and shall see and shall read all these words, then you shall say, O Lord, you have spoken against this place to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be desolate forever. And it shall be, when you have made an end of reading this book, that you shall bind a stone to it and cast it in the midst of Euphrates. And you shall say, Thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. Painful, ugly, nasty, necessary, true, yep. absolute, God's will. You know, if you want to make a, a cloud, whatever they call those little things, you, you have to <laughs> use the words that are appropriate. And the fact is, this is what God's going to do. And when he does it, it's not going to ever stand again. And you look in history and... Uh, sorry, my neck's a little hurt. Um, it's not, it's never, it's never happened in history. The only time this happens is in the end time with the feet of clay, miry clay and, and iron. Um, we should go back to, to Daniel for just a second. You know, um, and I don't, right, you'll tell us at some I, I can't hear you. Talking to your microphone a little more. I, I was saying the mark of the beast doesn't even come until after the destruction. Oh, yeah. That, that's a real basic thing that, that most people just, I don't know why they can't quite understand it. But the mark of the beast is interesting. When you start talking about the beast, there are a lot of things to know. But one of the biggest things is, is that the mark of the beast uh, comes at a particular time. And, you know, you have to go through and actually study all that to understand what's going on but the first beast is different than the second beast and when you look at what happens and you, you can say the seventh beast or the eighth beast you know it depends on how you're looking at it but the reality is the first beast has a particular purpose and the first beast is in control of everything Na uh, worldwide he becomes the ruler of the whole world and has there has no peer. So when you talk about the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast is actually instituted by what we call the second beast or the maybe the sixth, or seventh, seventh, I guess, um, who is also the, who is, yeah, maybe the sixth. It's a little confusing with the beast issue because there's, <laughs> you know, lots of issues. But the biggest thing to understand is, is that the mark of the beast doesn't happen with the first beast. The first beast is around for and, and has power for approximately three and a half years. So when you start talking about the beast, you have to realize that in America, the mark of the beast never occurs. And the mark of the beast is later. And honestly, that's a probably a four day study, you know, to cover all of that completely. Uh, so, you know, but just know that the, the mark of the beast doesn't come in America. It can't, because the first beast is only there for three and a half years, and it destroys everything. Um, and it's not until after the first beast is destroyed, because he goes down to Jerusalem. He goes down, and I'm not reading all the scriptures related to this, but he goes down to Jerusalem, and one of the two witnesses tells him to go home. And God actually speaks to him out of the heaven and says whatever he says. And then he goes home and is killed by two of his own people a little bit later. So 
the mark of the beast we don't have to worry about that now that's a later thing and it makes sense completely in the context of god's kingdom already being uh having begun so what what has to happen and, and this has to happen with everybody once they understand when the kingdom of god begins it begins earlier than we ever thought because we know when Christ returns um, we know precisely when he returns and his mount his feet hit the Mount of Olives and and you know it's at the last trumpet you know that's also one of the big proofs for the, the rapture being a, a joke um, but that has to happen at the last trumpet and everything it's actually flipped upside down from what everybody has said Everybody has said, okay, well, Christ comes back immediately, and then we all get wafted away into, you know, in the rapture, and then, uh, you know, God destroys stuff after we're gone, and then, you know, the millennium occurs, and, and they, they get it all completely, utterly backwards. And how God's revelation is actually going to occur is God reveals himself through us, very small at first, and then gradually going bigger and bigger. So that revelation occurs by God showing who he is through his people. And, you know, curtain call after curtain call through revelation, you see that growing bigger and bigger until finally the grand finale is Christ himself coming back, you know, with his clothes full of blood and, you know, that whole circumstance. So know that what everybody has said about prophecy in general in the end time is almost entirely backwards and you'll see as you're reading through the scriptures that that starts to be confirmed in various different ways and that the the beginning of understanding the scriptures is to know when the kingdom of god begins because and when israel and judah are together because that sets the stage for uh understanding so many scriptures that in all around through the prophets um that was another point I just lost because I was still talking about something else, but it'll come in talk, a second. Talk more about uh, the beginning of the kingdom of God. The beginning oh. okay, of well, actual... let, let, Let's go back and review really quick uh, in uh, Daniel 2, uh, 41. Yeah, 41. And whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. So that kingdom that's divided, and we talked about the rumors, that kingdom that's divided is likely uh, civil war here in America. There shall be in it of the strength of the iron and the weakness of the miry clay. And, you know, you can say, all right, well, the Republicans are the iron and the Democrats are the miry clay. Uh, maybe. Who knows? All I know is, is that there are two different factions that are going to get stronger and stronger until, you know, things start to break apart. Um, and 40, 43, whereas you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And, and to my way of thinking, this is God's people are not going to mix into this circumstance. And that may or may not be related to the Civil War, but it would surprise me if it wasn't in some way. Um, wouldn't surprise me if there were, you know, factions that happened to, you know, <laughs> get in political trouble, whether it's Northern Idaho and Kentucky against the rest of the world, the rest of the United States or not, I don't know, but <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of how it's shaping up at the moment. <laughs> um, and in the days, 44, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Know that when God's kingdom begins, it will continue. And it will never again, Jerusalem will never again be fully destroyed. But the, the abomination that makes desolate still has to occur after this. Okay? So the story is not over. When God begins his kingdom... The story is not over. Most of the stuff that happens in Revelation and in Daniel still has, has to occur after God establishes his kingdom. And this is where everybody gets really sideways because they can't quite comprehend that. And the problem is, is that they don't know the scriptures well enough to understand that that still can occur. So Jerusalem 
uh, does get into trouble later, another beast arises, other political powers occur, things happen, but we still haven't even seen the two witnesses together at the, at the beginning of God's kingdom. The beginning of God's kingdom occurs at the time that Babylon is destroyed, which is right directly after you know America's gone and the beast is still alive or is just about to die or is in that process. So know that when God's kingdom is established is entirely different when, than when anybody else has ever said because they haven't understood what's going on. So this is really important to keep track of this when you're reading your Bible because it's going to come up over and over and over and over. And whenever you see Jerusalem, or sorry, Israel and Judah together in prophecy, regardless of whether Babylon's mentioned, you know when that is. You know, as, as a brotherhood in Isaiah, whatever, wherever it happens to be, uh, know that that has to occur in that way, and yet the drama is still not even close to over. God fixes Babylon, he sets up his kingdom, and then a lot of things occur with the two witnesses and, you know, other things have to happen in the way that they've been said. Um, so it's different than anything that anybody has ever told you about how the end time happens. But it's important to get absolutely the most important thing to nail down without any question or doubt when the kingdom of God begins. It begins in the time of those kings. Um... Did I just read it? Yeah. Uh, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So you know when it is. The when is actually really clear. Uh, in their days, and they're not the days of the second beast. They're not the days of, you know, a bunch of other things that you could add in there. <clears throat> it's earlier than anybody assumes. And it also makes sense because think about when the children of Israel went into the land for the promised land. As soon as they went into the promised land, they had a millennial-like experience. And when God <laughs> takes away the sins of his people, we will have a millennial-like experience. So when we go back, like we're going to go right now to Isaiah 2. And it feels millennial. And he shall judge among the nations, verse 4, and he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. This is not permanent. And even, even in that, know that what God is going to do is he is going to use us to thresh the nations of the world. So know that this isn't finished. It's not you know, it's not not learn war anymore at all whatsoever for the end of, until the end of time. This is a period in which God uh, causes his people to have peace in the land in the midst of a world that is still not in peace. O house of Jacob, whenever you see Jacob, know that Israel and Israel and Judah are together. Jacob is a key word to tell you that they're together. Come you and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Therefore you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philist Philistines. Okay, so we're going back into, um, you know, how horrible they are. But this is, is going back slightly in time and saying this is how horrible they were, you know, and yet God's going to do this wonderful thing. It, it's easier to see maybe over in, in uh, uh, Mike. Let's go back to Mike. Seven ninety-five. Oops. Micah four. Okay, but in the last days, I'm going to go ahead and read it from the beginning. But in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. Notice that the world is not depopulated, and that God's government is not the only government out there. Okay, there are other nations and other hills. And everybody from all those nations are going to flow towards Jerusalem. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. These are people who are ignorant. And 
they're also people. God's people are still people. They aren't spirit beings. They haven't been raptured. We're still people. And the leaders of these people are at least one of the two witnesses immediately and the second one a little bit later. So realize that people are who we're dealing with here. We haven't gone past, you know, a lot of milestones yet. <laughs> uh, let's go up to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. There's still strong nations. This is not just God's government. It's not, it's not, you know, a millennial circumstance where everybody's going to Jerusalem that way. There are still strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into printing hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn more anymore. And that sounds final like, oh, well, that's the end of it. But it's really not. <laughs> It'll happen that way for a little while. What is really important also is verse 4. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. So this is a thread. When you talk about under his vine and under his fig tree, there's lots of scriptures in the Bible about this, and most of them are referring to this particular moment when God <coughs> begins his kingdom really important that you can connect these up and we'll see that if we go over to Zechariah if we have time and if you guys can stand verse five. Oh yeah we're, we're going on okay. for all people will walk everyone in the name of his God and we will walk in the name of our, the Lord our God forever and ever and this is really referring to God's people that are in Jerusalem not to everybody around the world in that day, says the Lord, I will assemble out of her, I will assemble her that halts, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that halts a remnant, and her that was cast off, far off, a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth, for even forever. And he will. There is absolutely no doubt that he will, and Jerusalem will never again be completely destroyed from that time. But it's, like I said, it's not the end of the story. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto you shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom, shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. And notice, again, that these are people. They're not spirit beings, they're people. So we're still involved in the drama of the world at this point. Now, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Is your counselor perished? For pangs have taken you as a woman in travail. So we've got God's people there, the first dominion, and yet everybody's crying aloud, is there no king in you? Why would he ask that question? Well, frankly, the second of the two witnesses hasn't showed up yet, and he will be the king, the prince, at that time, in that place, and, you know... In case you wonder, God will be probably the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud in the air over Jerusalem at that time, just like he was in Egypt, coming out of Egypt. So, and there's lots of proof of that, um, but we'll have to take it as it comes because there's a lot, that we, <laughs> lots of scriptures. <laughs> okay, we continue on. Verse 10, be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. Again, the daughter of Zion, not Zion, but the daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail, for now shall you go forth out of the city, and you shall dwell in the field, and you shall go even to Babylon. There shall you be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem you from the hand of your enemies. He ties it all together perfectly. He sets up his kingdom and this is, you know, going back in time for a moment, which he does all the time throughout the Bible, or throughout the prophets, uh, saying that this is where he will save us. This is where he's going to save us in Babylon. He will redeem us from the hand of our enemies in Babylon. Now also many nations are gathered against you that say, let her be defiled and let our eye look upon Zion. So in the end time, when you see this circumstance in verse 11 where everybody wants to destroy zion or jerusalem or god's people it's the same actual time as babylon is destroyed and what they're really trying to do is kill god's people 
That's really, in the end, that's their goal. They're trying to destroy God's people. Because in this moment of the destruction of Babylon, we're actually going to stand up as pillars and do what we're supposed to. And they're not going to like it a little bit, not even a tiny little bit. They're going to hate it. And it's going to be horrifying to them that we escape. <laughs> but then God is going to set us up in his kingdom and he's going to show us as an example to the whole world. And the end is not yet. <laughs> But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them as sheaths into the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron, and I will make your hooves brass, and you shall beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. We have a purpose for God to do what he wants. And it's not going to be a real pleasant thing from the standpoint of what we've been taught to be pacifists and whatnot. Not saying that we need to go out there and harm people. We need to have the same exact attitude Christ had when he was here on the earth. We need to act like him, and this will come in its time, and God will do what he wants in the way that he wants. We don't have any control over that. So, you guys dying yet? Because... I've been talking a long time. I can keep going, though. <laughs> I can't hear what he's saying, but probably, man, this guy talks a lot. <laughs> um, you're still sitting here, so I'll keep talking until somebody says, all right, shut up now. Okay. Um, so I mentioned the two witnesses a whole bunch. So one of the first things that you guys need to do if you're interested in the two witnesses is you need to read my paper on uh, the two witnesses and on the atonement because that goes through and describes a whole bunch of stuff and um, I can send you a link if you send me an email or you can get it from Marcy or... I have it. I'll, I'll read it this week. All right, yeah. Well, it's not light reading. So <laughs> it's not light reading. <laughs> Um, but it is one of those things that if you if you need to, what I would recommend is read through and just find out about the two witnesses first, and then maybe go back to what I'm saying about the the atonement and you know the kids, the goats, and all the all the different stuff that's in there about the atonement. Because while the atonement is extremely important and it's very, it's one of the unknown, the great unknown things about my, uh, about Christianity. Um, if you get to know the two witnesses just a little bit, it'll it'll help. You know, it'll open up your mind to who they actually are. <clears throat> um, but the atonement is extraordinarily important, and one of the reasons that's extraordinarily important is because the second of the two witnesses actually shows up uh, in that time where he's needed and becomes the prince, you know, what we were just talking about there. Um, I can't really go back and, and tell you all the information that you'll learn about the two witnesses in that paper, and believe me, there's a lot more than that. That is just like the really basics of some of some of the places you'll easily find, you know, types of who they are. Um, but the, it's a great the atonement is is absolutely critical because without an atonement, our sin doesn't actually go away. So. And maybe I'll just really quick talk about that for a second. So the sacrifice of Christ is absolutely perfect and pure. And he did what he was supposed to do. So he gave us the sacrifice. He gave us access to his blood. But that's not the end of the story. So when he gives us his blood, we have to actually repent, okay, be baptized. And, and there's a, a process that occurs whereby we can come to God. But the penalty for sin is not removed just because Christ was sacrificed. Okay? Most people understand that. If you're in worldwide, you probably have an idea of that, but maybe not. You know, they never explained what the atonement was. They never explained why it was important. But the atonement is actually a ceremony in which we stand before God, and God either removes our sin and atones for us, or doesn't, okay? And the example that we have to go to if we're going to talk about that kind of stuff is Zechariah 3. 
Papers for Terry and I. I'll get you more change. Let me let me go back to two for a second and see. Okay, let's go to two actually. Let's start in two. Oh crud! Uh, hold on. Let's go and start in first uh, chapter one, first one. Yeah, it's hard to go through this Zechariah without without starting here because you lose a whole bunch. So. Uh, verse 1, in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo the prophet, saying, The Lord has been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say you unto them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn you unto me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, says the Lord of hosts. So first thing you got to realize is we have to turn to him first. And the reason we have to turn to him first is because he gave us everything. He loved us first. He did everything for us first. And we're the ones who turned away from him. We have to turn back to him before he will turn to us. Which means that he has turned away from us right now. And this is an idea that is not <laughs> uncommon in the Bible. So God turns his back on us. There's a time when he will not hear us, period. Our cries, nothing. Seek you the Lord while he may be found. So there's a time in which he will not be found. So know that we have to turn to him first because of the circumstance that we're in. So verse 4, be not as your fathers. Uh, we'll see waving. If, if you're seeking him now and you found him, he's not going to leave you, right? Of course not. Okay, I just had to make sure. <laughs> That's the way I understand <laughs> Well, okay. if, if you forsake him and decide to go, you know, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, then, yeah, he'll drop you like a hot rock. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. But if you stay with him, then he'll stay with you. And what is involved in that process is faith and works of faith. Faith and more faith. The fourth, faith and more faith, which means that fear has to go away. So, yeah. you know, they're opposites, and that's in another one of the papers that I wrote. They're opposites. Fear and faith are total, complete opposites. Love will cast out fear, but fear and faith are the actual opposites. So, you know. Okay, I didn't hear Okay. Uh, verse 4, Be not as your fathers, unto whom the pro former prophets cried, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn you now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, says the Lord. So, <laughs> don't be like Israel and Judah and everybody else back in the day. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? <laughs> but my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? In other words, they're dead now because the, my words <laughs> took hold on them. And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so has he dealt with us. We don't want to be dealt with in that fashion. We want to be dealt with because our... Childish faces are turned up toward God saying, please, Father, save us. <laughs> Not anything else. Upon the four, in verse seven, upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Sebat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. Oh, I actually didn't want to read that. Uh, we can read this, but... Let's get past that because I don't I don't want to go through that. Yeah. I actually built in it. Okay, so uh, okay, so let's go down to verse thirteen. Nope, I was wrong. Verse twelve. Yeah, verse twelve, I guess. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you have had this indignation these three score and ten years? So 70 years, we're talking about a time period uh, after the temple was destroyed and everybody was hauled off to Babylon. And the Lord answered the angel that talked to me with good words, but know that this is roughly similar to our own circumstance because we're in Babylon now. So Daniel's circumstance, our circumstance, 
uh, a lot of the circumstances in the end time were similar to the circumstances of the prophets when they spoke. And this is by design, God did it for a reason. Um, so the angel that communed with me and said unto me, Cry you, saying, Thus is the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. So this is absolutely talking about us now here in this place. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. So right here in verse 16, we start getting into two witnesses territory. And what is two witnesses territory? Two witnesses territory is any time that the people of Jerusalem or the people of God, the inner court, the temple of God, are measured. And you see measuring lines, you see measuring reeds, you see plumb bobs, you see a variety of different tools that God talks about this. But whenever you see anyone measuring the temple of God, then there's something really extraordinary happening. Because, and we can go over to Revelation and talk about that a whole bunch too. But know that that whenever the city of God or the temple of God is measured, it's someone who is drawing a line, you know, whether it's in the sand or whatever, and anybody who crosses that line uh, either lives or die, dies depending upon, you know, where they are in reference to that line. So the idea of a measuring line or a measuring tape or any of that stuff is you measure to mark something where it will be cut. So the primary purpose of at least the one of the two witnesses initially is going to be measure where things are going to be cut off. And that happens in a variety of different ways, but mostly it's because people run up against him and... I don't know if we'll go there or not, but when they, when they speak to this guy, they make a decision, and that decision ends up being whether they live or whether they die. And you can find this in Jeremiah, particularly uh, in the early chapters of Jeremiah. Uh, I think it's 13 or... I don't think it's 15... I don't know where it is at the moment, and the language doesn't come to me or I'd go there right now. But the reality of it is, is that that measurement is exactly what we would do if we were a carpenter today. You measure something, you mark it, and then you cut it. And the, the, that one of the two witnesses, that particular one of the two witnesses, is not the one who cuts necessarily. That might happen a little bit, but the primary purpose of that is for is to mark things and then God, using someone else, cuts things off. So the beast or other men are who he uses to destroy other men. But people decide where they're going to live and where they're going to die. In the in you know in the in the end of it, it's going to be right in front of that one of the two witnesses who is whose name is born in Babylon. You know. Zerubbabel, born in Babylon. And we'll get to that as we read through. Okay. Uh, verse 17, crying, cry yet, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall comfort Zion, and yet choose Jerusalem. So we're going to Zion and Jerusalem. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I actually, yeah, I don't really want to, well, we can read it, it doesn't matter. And I said unto the angel that talked to me, what? What be these? And he answered and said, These are the horns which have scattered Ju Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed, showed me four carpenters. Then said I, What come these to do? And he spoke, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, and to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah, to scatter it. So there are four particular people, groups of people, or whatever, that cause much trouble to God's people. And he sends four carpenters also to fix that. And these are four men that God chooses to do this. And I don't know who they are, nobody knows who they are. But they are people that God chooses to do this thing. 
and there are a lot of different groups. Go ahead and name them off right quick, Mom. Um, uh, the two witness four carpenters, seven shepherds, eight principal men, uh, the the twelve who uh, go throughout the whole earth to to um, to repreach the gospel. There are the the seventy who are the the great scholars and the Septuagint, so to speak. I mean the um, okay, the well, uh, that, that's enough for now. So there's a bunch of different people that God uses. She just lists them off really well, so I just let her go with that. Yeah, yeah. Um. Um. So yeah, there, there's a bunch of different people that God uses, and the the first of those are the two witnesses. So and and they're throughout the Bible. They're not, they're not hidden, <laughs> but we have not seen them. So we yeah. have to actually see what God has to say about them. And uh, we can talk about that, and we'll go to Acts here at some point. Somebody remind me if I forget, and we'll go see one of the two witnesses in Acts. But let's continue here for now. Yeah. Uh, We're getting pretty late, so you're going to need to sort of wind minutes. it up. Ten minutes. What? We're never yeah. going to get through all this. Yeah. Well, wind us up. All right, well, well I'll, I'll go really fast here. I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. And then I explained what that's about before. Then said, then said I, where do I go? And he said unto me to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. So we're talking about when... God's people come back. For I, says the Lord, says the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. So there's the pillar of fire and or wall of fire, whatever you want to call it, and the glory in the midst of her. And then suddenly, oddly, verse two, verse six, ho ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, says the Lord of hosts. Deliver yourself, O Zion, that dwells with the daughter of Babylon. So, two witnesses, context, you know, we're talking about, <laughs> yeah, a whole lot of important stuff. This young man that we're talking about in verse 4, we're going to hit that a whole lot more. Deliver yourself of Zion that dwells with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after the glory, has he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. For behold, I will shake my hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I will come and I will dwell in the midst of you, says the Lord of hosts. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. So again, we're talking about people and God being read in the midst of us in Jerusalem in this millennial-like period when the rest of the world is not millennial. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. And verse chapter 3, verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. So, this whole circumstance, Zechariah 3, is really, really important because it shows you the circumstances of an atonement. And not only the atonement, but the most important atonement that has ever occurred in the history of the world. So this is really important to realize that we're in a court-like setting. The best way to describe it or best way to, to visualize it is to understand that we're in a courtroom. And we have God the Father here, and we have... Jesus Christ, let's see if I can get it on the right side for you guys. Ah, it doesn't matter. On the, on the defense's side, we have Jesus Christ as the advocate for the defense. He's our high priest. He's the guy who is pleading our case. We're on the defensive side, and we have Satan standing at our right hand to resist us. Okay? That's our circumstance. It's a, it's a courtroom. And, you know, Joshua, in this case, is in this circumstance... And he answered, verse, verse 4, And he answered and spoke unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with a change of raiment. So 
Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you. This is an atonement. Whenever sin is actually removed, it is a rare thing. It is unusual for an atonement to occur. We have examples of this occurring in the New Testament in the, in the Gospels. You know, arise and walk. What is easier to say? That your sins be forgiven you or arise and walk? Whenever you have healing, you have an atonement. If there is no healing, then there is no atonement, and your iniquity remains with you. And this is a really, really hard concept for a lot of people to deal with. So, and believe me, it's another hurdle. So, the fact that we have the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the Passover does not necessarily equal a lack of sin just because we keep the Passover. What has to happen for the sin to be removed is for the atonement to occur. And those can occur in one single moment, but it is not, God has to do something. So when you're standing here in front of this courtroom, God has to say, your iniquity, I will, behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you. It's never a circumstance where we can just, you know, take the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in the Passover and say, all right, well, my sins are forgiven me, I'm perfect now. And we've been taught that from a young age throughout all of Christianity. But that is actually not the case. It's a lie. And it takes nothing away from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It takes nothing away from the Passover. But the Passover and the atonement have to work together to get to that point where you are without sin. So read about that in great depth in that paper because I, I explained it all extraordinarily clearly, meticulously. Um, but know that it is a requirement. And we'll continue reading because it's very important to see that this isn't just for Joshua, who is the second of the two witnesses. And I said, let them set a fair miter upon his head. I'm not going to go into the details of all this because there are a lot of details here. So they set a fair miter upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by <coughs> and the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, then you shall also judge my house. And somebody who judges the house of God is the one who is over the house of God. And you shall also keep my courts, and I will give you places to walk among these that stand by. And when he's talking about those that stand by, we're talking about some of those mighty men, the four carpenters, and etc., Verse 8, Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your fellows that sit before you, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. There are two branches. Christ is the tree trunk, he is the true vine, and there are two branches. There are his arms, there are the two witnesses, the two olive trees, the two candlesticks. You know, go through that paper and you'll see what I'm talking about. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. This is the atonement of all of Israel and Jerusalem and Jacob in one day. And in that day, says the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. That should relate right back to that scripture we read earlier in your head. So, that stone is really, really important because that's the same stone that's cut out in Daniel 2. Only that stone is before Zerubbabel at that time and gets laid in front of Joshua when he becomes the high priest and the king of that time in Jerusalem where the temple is going to be. So, this is all tied together and precision. God has done it in a very precision fashion. And we can go and continue. <laughs> and, you know, Zechariah 4 goes through all of this same thing. So an angel that talked to me came out again and waked me as a man that was waking out of his sleep. And he said unto me, what do you see? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick, all of gold, a bowl on top of it, the seven lamps thereon, seven pipes, the seven lamps. And verse 3, there you have the two witnesses again, and the two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side. So I answered and spoke to the angel and talked to me, What are these, my lord? Don't you know what these are? Don't you know what these are? 
And then verse 6, then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Again, verse 7, Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstones thereof with shoutings, crying grace, grace unto it. This is the destruction of Babylon. That's the great mountain that's thrown into the sea. The stone is the one that was cut out without hands. And Zerubbabel, born in Babylon, is the first of the two witnesses that brings it and God's people out like Moses coming out of the land of Egypt. And going to Zion, going to Jerusalem. Yes. Isn't that? And, you know, you can keep going on. I mean, I, there, uh, we just don't have time. But you, talk, you keep going on and you talk about, uh, you know, for who has despised the day of small things, for they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hands of Zerubbabel with those seven there, the eyes of the whole whole world, uh, eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. I mean, again, verse 11, then I answered and said unto him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left thereof? And I answered and said unto him, what are these two olive trees? You know, it goes down and says, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of, whole earth, of the whole earth there in 14. So we're talking about two witnesses. It's all, you know, to me, it's very, very clear what's going on. It takes some time to be able to parse all of this, though. You, you can't just read it once and expect that all of the understanding will just soak in instantaneously, because it's not that way. <laughs> um, no, but when you see it, all the different scriptures lined up in the way that they're supposed to be lined up, it becomes obvious. And then having seen those things, your mind is, it starts looking for the things that it knows belongs together. So... Just study and read and do your thing, and God will show. And just so you know, I am not a, I am not a uh, pastor of a church or anything. I'm not, and never will be. Well, maybe not never, but that's not my that's not my job description. That's not what I'm all about. So um, I don't chase people around, and I don't take anybody's money. <laughs> um, and now, really quick, let's go over to Acts. Two. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see if I can find it here. It should be seventeen. There's a lot of things that are important here, but I'm trying to find a particular thing. I think it's actually in three, but I'm just trying to make sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, probably ours is three. <laughs> I always forget that. She got the same Bible. Yeah, no, but I mean for different from oh. his. Yeah. Talking about the violent wind, or are you talking about the... Um, no, the um, go to verse... Uh, 18. There was some stuff there in 2 that's appropriate too, but I don't have time, so let's go to 3. 3.18. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of, the, of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. <clears throat> Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins be, may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That your sins may be blotted out. Does that sound familiar like anything we just read a minute ago? when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. <laughs> when, he's, when, he's, when he's actually there. 319. 319. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things. The restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. What, we're, what I've just been talking about when the kingdom of God is established is the restoration of all things, the restitution of all things, however you want to say it. That's what we're talking about. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. <clears throat> yea, all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. 
So we're talking about uh, Paul here. Jesus Christ is already long dead. And Paul is referring back to the restitution, the restoration of all things spoken of by the holy prophets. And he's talking about this prophet that has to come in the end time. This is, this is um, Elijah the prophet who comes in the end time. He will be the first of the two witnesses. And the only reason I bring this up particularly is because it's the only reference, it's the only clear reference uh, after Jesus Christ's death where we speak of a prophet that has power that is not directly, I mean absolutely directly associated with Jesus Christ himself. And this is something that happens in the end time, and Paul just clarifies it. That's awesome. Yes, it is. It's pretty cool. There's yeah. lots of stuff. We've we've barely hit the, the a little bit of the ice on the side of the iceberg. <laughs> it's really fascinating. What I found the most fascinating is once I read this and saw like my eye well wow how did i miss that then the whole thing comes alive right it does but <clears throat> my bible and then, i don't yeah, need that open now, more like, and more and more right. yeah like, well any scriptures back there the the thing about this whole thing is i'm going to tell you guys the the key and the secret to understanding prophecy the key and the secret to under, understanding prophecy is that when God tells you what your sins are, you have to admit them. So everything that God says in the prophets is all about you stupid idiots who are just the most horrible, nasty, idolatrous people there are. You have to take responsibility for that. You have to admit that that's you. Whatever the horror of whatever sin it is that God's saying, you have to admit it. You have to grasp that and say, yeah, I'm guilty of that. And this is called humility. <laughs> In the end, it's humility and being willing to take uh, responsibility for our sins. And if you don't do that, what happens is, is you, your eyes are blinded. You blind yourself almost instantaneously. As soon as you say, oh, well, that's them, you can't get anything more out of the prophets. They will literally, it will dry up before your eyes. And this is the state of blindness that we're in. And if we don't take responsibility for those sins, then we are unable to see these things clearly. You know, you might be able to hold on to something for a little while, but the reality is, is most of it goes away. If you don't take responsibility and say, all right, well, God, you said these are my sins. I believe you. And that's the thing that we have to believe immediately is how bad we are compared to what he, you know, has said. We're, we're terrible. Um, it's just my, the way it is. Say, Lord, forgive us our sins. We've sinned. Yeah. I didn't quite understand all of that at first either. I'm still working on it. But yeah. The, you know. There's a lot to it. But the, the rite of passage to understand much of prophecy at all is to admit that you're the one who did whatever it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Because in one way or another, we're responsible for all of the horrors that are around us. It may be passive, you know. But sin one, you sin, you sin once, you've sinned all the sins. I can't. Sorry, my phrase isn't very good, but. <laughs> is I guess. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. No problem. Yeah. Thanks, Brett. We'll talk to you later. Appreciate Love you. It. Yeah. Bye. Love you all. See you later. Thank you.